has begun I can feel the blessings falling Sanctifying heart and mind I can hear the Spirit calling Me from care to holy time Holy time, now God is with us I can feel His presence near I can hear His still small voices Heaven's peace and joy to share God, I know that You are with me I have always seen the signs But there is nothing Quite a special like when we meet for holy time. Mm -hmm. Holy time, a taste of heaven, oh, the fullness of his love out of all. Chose the seventh fresh anointing from above. I have tasted living water, nothing like this, none will find. Oh, the beauty of God's presence when we meet for holy time. Only righteousness, New Jerusalem descended with the saints of God to rest. I'll forever sing God's praises, for He'll be forever mine. Then to face we'll be together God and I Jesus and I my Lord and Sabbath day, hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus, bless your name. How can I build credit if I don't?
Welcome everyone to another Mighty Angels Ministries broadcast, but at the same time, we want to thank you all for joining us here on this Sabbath day. And I want to say to everybody, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath, because remember, this is the best day out of the week that God has set aside for all of us that we might find time to rest, to rest in Jesus, not in what we want to do, but in delighting ourselves in the things that God wants to do. With that thought in mind, I want to call your attention now to the importance of prayer, because brothers and sisters, as we study now, we must understand that we are in the informing, we are in a time when the image of the beast is forming. And it's important that we spend time in much prayer and search the scriptures. Remember, only those that fortify the mind with the word of God will stand through the last great crisis. Now, brothers and sisters, we know that this issue is coming, but she's very clear. Only those who fortify the mind. It's time for you to study the word of God and to fortify your mind with the word of God, with Bible truth, brothers and sisters. You know, you can watch all the current events that's taking place, and there's some serious things that are happening. We have an economic shortage about to take place because of the situation, the collapsing of the bridge in Baltimore. We're going to have also a high gas prices is going to go out of the roof. They're going to actually create the situation where you will be at a point where you will own nothing and be happy. Brothers and sisters, the Bible foretells a time when man can't what? Buy or sell. So all these things are culminating into the final issues of the great controversy. And it's important that we understand what we're looking at. It's important that we make the preparation spiritually, sin our sins before him, the judgment while Jesus is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, if there was ever a time when I want to call your attention to these things, and, and hopefully you are paying attention, and you'll go back and search these things out. I don't know everything. I'm not going to profess to know everything. But whatever I do know, I try to share with you, and I try to keep you in the Word of God. Because in the long run, your faith must be in the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. With that thought in mind, we're going to have a word of prayer. And then we're going to have our song of meditation. And after that song of meditation, we're going to get right back into our subject, the Ten Horns, Part 2, and the New World Order. We're going to look at that, Part 1. Actually, the Ten Horns, we're dealing with it. We're dealing with the second part of that, but it's actually going to be a two-part series on this issue of the New World Order and the Ten Horns combined. All right? So keep that in mind. With that thought in mind, let us pray. Father in heaven, we bow before thee, realizing that without thee we can do nothing. We want to pause and say, first of all, thank you for the Holy Sabbath that has come in. Help us relish each moment that we can have and rest with thee. For the time is coming when we will not be able to relish the Sabbath as much as we are today. And help us to realize that that time we must cherish by faith our rest. We must cherish by faith that Jesus is coming again. We must cherish by faith that we have sinned our sins before him, the judgment, and we must cherish by faith that our lives are hid in thee, whether we feel it or not. Lord, help us stand on the word of God by faith and meet the conditions 
by which the promise can be given. Now, Father, abide with us, we pray, and grant that the Holy Spirit will keep us. We ask this all now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. At this time, we're going to have our song of meditation, and then we're going to get right into our subject this evening. Often you wonder why tears come into Promises or 
Fear is our language God understands. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Father in heaven, again, as we open your word, please grant us understanding of the scriptures. Help us rightly divide the word of truth. Please grant that your Holy Spirit will abide with us and be in us as we enter into rest on this your holy Sabbath day. In these hours, help us to enjoy and delight ourselves in thee. We ask this all in Jesus' name to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. We direct our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, welcome, everyone. And at this time, we're going to uh, go to our, we're going to go back where we left off on our PowerPoint. We're talking about the ten horns, and I want you to see something very important here as we talk about this issue, all right? So just uh, bear with me for just a moment as I just make a little adjustment here for myself. Uh, here for a minute, so you can see a little bit closer. Yes, all right? So now, the Lord has not given you, now we would talk, We left off talking about this issue because we were letting people know that the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in spite of apostasy that might be seen among us at times, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not Babylon, and not all our pastors are gone, all right? I need to make that clear. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is not Babylon. Uh, we may have people who are uh, wearing Babylonian garments and Babylonian theology among us, but our church is not Babylon, never has been, never will be, all right? We are in danger of becoming a sister to Babylon if we don't put away some of the evils that we see taking place among us. In fact, let's go back one slide. I think I think one slide, I think I did talk about that issue. We were in danger of becoming a sister to Babylon. Every year, um, a yes. communical meeting is held with the Pope called the Conference of Secretaries of Christian World Communion. And the list of participants is staggering. The Anglican Church, World Baptist Alliance, the Orthodox Church, Seventh-day Adventist Church, yes, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the World Lutheran Church, the Mennonite World Conference, the Moravian Church Worldwide, Pentecostals, the Salvation Army, the Quakers, the World Churches of Christ, the World Evangelical Alliance, the World Methodist Church, and the World Council of Churches. These are all coming together now, to promote unity with Babylon. Now, brothers and sisters, we know that these things are happening. But now I want to read a statement to you. But I want you to take this statement and understand what we are. We got some in high places who believe that it's okay to be friendly with Rome and friendly with the fallen churches that have rejected the first, second, and especially now the third angel's message. But listen what we were told. We are in danger of becoming a sister to fallen Babylon, of allowing our churches to become what? Corrupt. Now, what will make us a danger? What make us become a in danger of becoming a sister to Babylon? By letting our churches become corrupt. In other words, letting worldliness into our churches, letting a uh, false theology into our churches. Uh, these type of things that we see taking place, and we see it taking place already in some of our camp meetings and in some of our Pathfinder meetings for our young people. Remember, the young people are the next generation that's going to determine where the Adventist Church will go if this is if if God if God doesn't intervene. Listen carefully. It says of allowing our churches to become corrupt and filled with what every foul spirit and they cage every unclean and hateful bird. The ultra-liberalism that we see taking place in our churches that is calling, that has undermined the authority of the scriptures, undermined the authority of the spirit of prophecy, is the reason why we can become, and we are in danger of becoming a sister to Babylon. Listen carefully. And a hateful bird, it says here, for every, it says here, but now remember now, some of our churches, not all of our churches, and some of our pastors and leaders may fall in this category, but not all. Thank God it's not all. And some of our self-supporting people have yet to be tested on these matters, and some of them will fall with the rest of the churches. Brothers and sisters, because some have a form of godliness and deny the power. And when the Bible lets us know, so it's not, so no matter what camp you may want to find yourself in, you're not safe unless you're really having your personal relationship with Jesus within the church or if you have a personal relation to Jesus in the self-supporting realm. 
Because if you do, you're going to be on one accord with the word of God. And with the word, and you're in one accord with the word, you're going to be in one accord with those who are in harmony with the word, whether they be in the organized church or whether they be in self-supporting lines. Brothers and sisters, the two sticks, the organized church and the self-supporting church, are going to wind up coming together very soon. And the image and mark of the beast is going to see to that, brothers and sisters. I want you to understand what we fail to do in our own free will, we will be brought forced to do it when we're brought face to face with the very, very crisis that we've been warned about all these years. But I want you to notice this with me as well. Unless we make a decided, it says here, we are in danger of becoming a sister to Babylon of allowing our churches to become corrupt and filled with every foul spirit and the cage, every unclean, hateful bird. And we, and we will, it says, and will we be clear unless we make decided movements to cure the existing evil? So what are we to cure? The existing evil, the corruption that is coming into our churches, the lowering of the standard in our churches, the lowering of the standard even in self-supporting lines as well. We are to uphold that standard and not allow worldliness or worldly policies or fanaticism to come in among us. This is what you got. You got two types of fanaticism. You got one group that claims that if you don't do it my way, it's the highway. That's a strong, that's an aspect of fanaticism. And that can be in the organized churches at time, and it can also be in self-supporting lines. And also, we have another group that goes by impressions and feelings, but not necessarily following the word of God. These two things, we are told, will bring in corruption and would also open a door for every foul spirit and every unclean and hateful bird. Brothers and sisters, we want, so our Seventh-day Adventist church is not Babylon. There is apostasy among us, and yet at the same time, we are called to hold up a standard and gather warmth from people's coldness and loyalty to their treason. So we must uphold the standards of the Word of God, must uphold what we understand to be as Seventh-day Adventists. All right, let's go to our next point right quick. Next slide. The Lord has not given you a message to call the Seventh-day Adventist Church Babylon and to call the people, listen, and to call the people of God to come out of her. Call the, people, the Lord, Lord has not given nobody a message to call the people out of where? The Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, there are some people who have been put out the church, and that's why some of them are in self-supporting. Now, I can't speak for all of them, but I know some are like that. And they have not been, they did not get just dealings with some of the brethren, because some of the brethren in high places used high-handed power and corrupt methods to get their way. And they unreasonably and uh, unjustly, did, uh, how you say, um, disfellowship some of God's people. And so, brothers and sisters, God will deal with them and very soon, and God will deal with those brethren who have done that unjustly. Just make sure you don't get an attitude with them. Just make sure you don't go around hating them and despising them and making them your hobby horse to attack them. Make sure you understand you need to pray for those that despite and misuse you and abuse you and say our matter of evil falsely, Jesus said, for my name's sake. So you need to understand that self-supporting churches are only as good if they've been mistreated and justly set up and they've mistreated and God allowed them to be set up, you only can survive as you are faithful to the word of God and the spirit of prophecy. You will not survive if you violate the commandments of God, mistreat God's people, or mishandle money, or get caught in some type of scandal or immoral behavior. You will not survive. So brothers and sisters, remember that as we go about this time and let us keep our minds and our hearts fixed on Jesus and the message for this time. Let's continue on and the work to save souls. This is what our work is calling. All right. So God's law is the standard of righteousness that we need to understand. In Psalms 119, 172, what does the Bible say concerning God's law? In Psalms 119, 172, I'd like somebody to read that for us. Psalms 119, 172. My tongue shall speak of your, your words, for all your commandments are righteousness. So the Bible shows that the standard of righteousness is not is God's commandments. 
But also with that, we have 2 Timothy 3.16. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in what? Righteousness. So the standard of righteousness is the word of God and the law of God. But also with the word and the law, it discovers the other part of that standard is Christ's character. That's, the, that's one of the most important aspects of it because you can have the word and you can have the law and not be converted where you bear the fruits of the spirit to have Christ-like character. Therefore, you become a legalist while professing reform. And God help us because there have been a lot of them like that to, in, these, in these times past where men have been uh, very, call themselves bringing about reforms on the outward, but their attitude and their characters show something totally different. And their shrewdness in business shows that they were not liberal in their giving or in helping those that were working under them. So brothers and sisters, I want you to see very clearly again that there's a standard that we must uphold. And that standard is first and foremost going to be a Christ-like character with the fruits of the Spirit. Not by their talents will you know them. Jesus said, by their fruit you will know them. Now, those very careful. Not by their preaching will you know them. Not by their gift of gab will you know them. But by their what? By their fruit you will know them. And so what are the fruit? What is the fruit? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Meekness and temperance. It didn't say fruits, it said fruit, singular. These are all part of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of one who is seeking daily to submit, keep himself crucified, and submit his will to God and want to love his neighbor like he loved himself. Now, why is this important? Because the final issues of the great controversy is over the law of God. Remember, we were told very clearly that Lucifer was in heaven, and what was his issue over? He said that angels needed no law. You can read that in the book Patriots and Prophets, and that they were, and that they could no longer, uh, they would not be able to violate God's law. He made it clear in his rebellion and his apostasy to God in heaven, and that's in the book Patriots and Prophets. And their wise sin was permitted. But then you go back and you look a little closer on this same issue, and you begin to realize that in order for Lucifer to be as God. In Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14, what did Lucifer say? In Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, he says what? The Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How thou did cut down to the ground, did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, the Bible shows very clearly that Lucifer's desire is to be like God in power, not like God in character. And so we're going to see, and we're going to see that being played out on a worldwide stage as we're looking at the issue of the rise of the final scenes of Earth's history and the rise of the one world government that we see taking place. But with this one world government, as we just seen a minute ago, we got all the world's religions being involved in so-called a unity, which is also to lay the foundation for world government, but also for world religion. And in the end, the world religions are gonna have more power than the political powers of the governments. And we're gonna see the whole world form the image to the beast, starting with the United States of America and leading to the whole world around you forming the image of the beast. God to heaven will look down from heaven and be able to see that the whole world is formed the image and the and received the mark, except those whose names are in the book of life. Brothers and sisters, our message about the first angel's message is critical at this time. What does the first angel's message say? Could somebody read for us Revelation 14? Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made the heaven, the and earth, 
and the sea and the fountains of the waters. Notice it says, for the hour of his what? The hour of his judgment, judgment is come. The Bible said in time, as the nations are being brought together, the Bible foretells that the Bible says that they will be brought together at a time when the final message is being given, but their names will not be found written in the book of life. Many Christians' names will not be found written in the book of life, along with those who are in the world. Why? Because they would have rejected the first, second, and third angel's message that called for men to understand that the hour of God's judgment had come. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, I'm trying to give you this in light of the 10 horns that we're going to talk about. I'm just giving you the backdrop on why our message is so important at this time, right about now. We're in the formation of the image of the beast, and the message must be given, and it must go like wildfire, like fire in the stubble, now. You can't wait until it's formed and then say, I'm going to do it. You got to be doing it now that when it forms, you know you have already been walking with the Spirit of God and in the Spirit while giving the message. And God will strengthen you to continue to get that message as you seek to bring souls to Jesus and make sure you confess and put away your sins and seek a Christ-like character. This is why it's so important for us to understand this at this time. Look what the Bible says here in uh, looking at this issue. He said, the hour of his what? Judgment has come. What Now, what is at the throne of God? Could somebody read to me? Could somebody tell me what is at the throne of God? And based on, and let's look at this for a moment, because the mighty angel, Revelation chapter 10, is coming down in his time of judgment. And we're going to find this time of judgment. While this judgment is taking place, the nations are being brought together. And I want you to see this simultaneously. These events are happening. I know you look Looking at the events with the bridge and everything else, but I need you to look a little bit closer. There's something more important than the bridge collapsing and the economic thrust that's taking place. There's an eternal interest at stake, and that eternal interest is you keeping your eyes on Jesus in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary in this hour of judgment. And if it sounds like to you like a broken record, we've been talking about this stuff before. Brothers and sisters, we can't help but bring it up because it is relevant. It is relevant for us right now in the hearse, in the world that we're in today as we live and to God's people right now who are putting off the day of God, who are becoming slack and indifferent to the very cause of God and in how they treat one another. Brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it. You are in the final scenes of earth's history. But if that's the case, then what is happening in heaven? We are going into the final scenes of judgment. And we must send our sins beforehand to God in judgment if we're going to stand through the last great crisis. Now, just to be sure with you, just a moment, or just for a moment, we talk about judgment, then we get into our two horns issue. I want you to just see something with me. Where did the Bible say judgment began? I want everybody to see this again with me for a moment. Because if we're heading into the image of the beast, brothers and sisters, that means that somewhere along the line in heaven, we about the judgment is about to go from the righteous dead to the righteous living. We don't know when, we don't know how soon, we don't know what, there's no particular event that can actually show us, but we can know and one thing, that if we're in the image of the beast, that means we'll be judged while we're living, and it will determine if we receive the seal of God or not while we're living, brothers and sisters. So we're heading for the final scenes, and I want you to understand why it's important that you search your soul and work out your salvation with fear and trembling right about now. Look what the Bible said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. Because somebody read that for I'm, I'm sorry, before we go there, I said, I said, what is it? Let's what is that the throne of God? Let's be sure. Go to me Psalms 89, 14. Because somebody read Psalms 89, 14 for me. I want to be sure that we talk and write. Psalms 89, 14. What is that the throne of God, according to the Bible? Psalms 89, 14, justice and judgment are the habitation of your throne. Mercy and truth shall go before your face. All right. Notice justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Justice is another word for justice is righteousness. So righteousness and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Psalms 97, 2. Because somebody read that for us. Psalms 97, 2, to be sure. We also got mercy and truth. But what else? Let's see it again. Psalms 97, 2. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. 
All right. The word habitation means foundation. So what is God's throne standing on? Righteousness and what? Judgment. Are we going to be judged? Are we going to be judged with righteousness? What did we say yeah. righteousness was a minute ago? So speak ye and do ye. Watch James. Look at uh, Psalms 119, 172. Remember? My tongue, brother, uh, brother read it to us a minute ago. My tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are what? Righteousness. So righteousness and judgment are the habitation of the throne. Right? Now notice the habitation means foundation. And so the commandments of God and the word of God are the foundation of God's throne, along with the character of Christ. That is the foundation of his throne. And the Bible says that's righteousness. And then also what? Judgment. Could somebody tell me, could somebody read Psalms 9, 7? Psalms 9, 7. What is the throne prepared for? Psalms 9, 7. And the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He has prepared his throne for what? Judgment. judgment. So what, what, what's at the throne? What's going on at the throne right now? Fear God. Give glory to him. For the hour of his what? Judgment is come. Where did Jesus go in 1844? He went from the holy place into the most holy place. At the Ark of the Covenant is where the throne of God is. And at this time, since 1844, you and I have been living in the hour of God's what? Judgment. Let's go a little bit closer about that. 1 Peter 4, 17. Because somebody read 1 Peter 4, 17 now for just a moment. First Peter four seventeen, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begins at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Hmm. Can you read verse eighteen with that? And if the righteous, oh. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Mm -hmm. What is it say about the righteous, everybody? If the righteous, what? Scarcely be saved. Mercy. We're in trouble. Now notice what else. Okay, we're in trouble. That's right. Notice very carefully, again, that the Bible shows very carefully that judgment begins where? At the house of God. But I need you to look at something else with me for just a moment. Look here with me at 1 Timothy 3.15. Can somebody read that for us? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Let's be sure what the house of God is so we can understand why we're giving this message about under the first angel. 1 Peter, uh, 1 Timothy 3.15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to be lead, behave, Thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. What is the house of God, everybody? The house of God is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of what? Truth. Notice very carefully. So the house of God is the church. So judgment begins with God's people, his church. Are y'all with me now? And so now go a bit closer. Why, did, why this is going on? What is going to be the standard of the judgment? I want to make sure you understand again. The great controversy is over the law of God. So I want to know again, what will be the standard of the judgment? Go with me to James 2, 12 through 14. Let's be, I believe that's what I want. James chapter 2, 12 through 14. Can somebody read that for us? James chapter 2, verses 12 through, uh, Acts, actually, to verse, uh, not verse 10 through 12. James 2, 10 through 12. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend it in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, for he that said, do not commit adultery, say also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. What's going to be the standard of the judgment? The law of what? Liberty. 
What law, this is talking about the Ten Commandments, will be the standard of the law or liberty of the judgment. You know, it's amazing that the Christian world has said that the law of God has been nailed to the cross. They have also now said there's no such thing as a separation of church and state. Two bulwarks that help America and also help Christianity are both being denied by professed Christians today. Some who do not believe or who have become very liberal minded and have not looked back again and really understood the foundation and that their forefathers faced in Europe when they crossed over to the sort of that's what made them have the uh, faith and actually the actual strength to cross the Mayflower in 1620 and come to come to the land on the shores of America. Brothers and sisters, if we understood that, we would understand this very carefully. This, I want you to notice very carefully what, what's going on. Uh, I'll notice again with me as we look a bit closer at this issue. Now that we understand this and we understand the hour of God's judgment is going on, and the Bible said all whose names are not in the book of life will worship the beast and his image. Brothers and sisters, let us send our sins beforehand to judgment. Isn't that what the Bible tells us to do? Does that, that is that not the case here? In second in Acts chapter three, go with me there for a minute. Acts chapter, I think it's Acts chapter three. I'm thinking about. Let me give you this so you can look at this for a moment. Don't you understand that this is more important than what you just saw with the bridge? The bridge thing is is important when you understand what's happening with the nation. But when you talk talking about your eternal life, the most important thing is that you're going to seek to keep your salvation worked out with fear and trembling and keep your name in the book of life and that you'll be prepared to stand in God's judgment. That, by faith, is more important than everything else you're watching because that will determine your eternal destiny and mine, for that matter. All right? So none of us are above that above this situation. Now, I just want you to see with me for a moment what the Bible says about this issue, about sending your sins beforehand to judgment, all right? In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, this is what the Bible says there, Acts 3, 19. Could somebody read Acts chapter 3, verse 19 for me? It says, repent, repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Did everybody catch that? Repent and be what? Converted. Converted. Now, what's, what's, the, what's the biggest issue we need? How can we help our church or help church members avoid being connected with Babylon? We must help the people see their need to repent and be what? Converted. Converted. Because it's through conversion that we are able to put away corruption. Amen. We can call sin by its right name. And we can do all that, but we still got to, the people got to see their need to accept Christ and be converted, regardless if you're a leader or if you're a pastor or if you're a church member. The, the issue is being reconverted. That, therefore, as we're reconverted, as we're truly converted, we can uphold the standard in love and maintain the counsel of God at the same time. And not and not be hypocritical in our actions nor falsify or, or treat anyone with injustice. This is the thing that the word of God tells us to do. And so it's very important that we keep this before us at all times. Now, notice again, and that, it talks about repent, therefore, and be converted. Your sins may be what? Blotted out. Brothers and sisters, when Peter, when Paul wrote this, there was, Luke wrote the book of Acts, by the way. So when Luke wrote this book, there was no, investigative judgment taking place yet. They were warning that the time of the judgment was coming and that this, they need to send their sins beforehand to be blotted out. Now, brothers and sisters, you and I are in the hour of judgment since 1844 at the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel on the 23rd of days. And we are now in the hour of judgment when our sins need to be what? Blotted out. So we are to be sending our sins beforehand, confessed and forsaken. Remember Proverbs 28, 13, he that covers sins shall not prosper. But whosoever confess and forsake of his sins shall have mercy. And so therefore, he that turn away his ear from hearing the law, Proverbs 28, 9, even his prayer is an abomination. So brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us that we need to confess and forsake our sins. And David told us that if we turn away our ear from hearing the law, even our prayer is an abomination. And Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayer. 
So how important for us to be converted at this time? How important for us to ask, the God, ask God that grant us the Holy Spirit that the goodness of God may lead us to repentance? How important is it right now in this time which you're living where you're watching the image of the beast being formed, where you're watching uh, major events taking place in America and around the world that's showing that the issue of Sunday observance is coming and showing also that we're heading for some hard times economically and in the very near future with the issue of a great reset and a world economic upturn to bring about a new world order. Brothers and sisters, we are watching the very event that we were told would take place at that time. And it, is in, and it behooves us to get ready and stay ready and fortify our mind with the word of God and understand, be conscientiously understanding that we are in the hour of God's judgment. And we need to make sure right now that we had a clean case before God. If I if I should die before Jesus comes, I want my sins to be sent before him, the judgment. I want to have peace with God and I want to have peace within. And I want to be sure that I I was in Jesus, and Jesus was in me through the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit to confirm that he's with me and in me, brothers and sisters, and you need it too. And you can only get it through the daily prayer and Bible study. This is not coming at no last minute. You're not going to get no last minute situations very soon. What you need, what we need to do and what we have to do, we have to do now while we have opportunity. Now while the Spirit is speaking to us. Now is the time to repent. Now is the time to turn from sin. Now is the time to put our lives in order. Now is the time, brothers and sisters, not tomorrow, not next week. Now is the time to put our house in order and keep it in order. For we are heading for troublous waters. And this judgment is constantly, is moving towards the righteous living. Brothers and sisters, please. Please work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Please don't put it off. Okay? If you don't have to accept what I'm saying, then go back and search the scriptures yourself. Go back and study the history about the judgment. Study about 1844 again. And understand that you're in the last scenes of earth's history and that you got a case pending at the bar of God and now is the time. Now is the acceptable day of salvation. If you hear his voice, the Bible said, harden not your heart. Now, last week we had talked about this issue. I'm not talking about now. We're in the hour of judgment. So in the hour of God's judgment, the final scenes of earth's history is now taking place. Everybody catch that? In the hour of God's judgment, the final scenes of earth's history is taking place. And so now we watch the issue of the image of the beast. We're watching now major events taking place that's going to impede and cause more hardships in America and around the world. We're watching wars and rumors of wars in Ukraine and in the Gaza Strip. We're watching every event taking place. We just got through watching a major pandemic and another one. Is three Christians who face execution in a third world country because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Um, so hard to believe. And every Christian, every person out from. there should see this film. You should run, not walk, um, the theaters. It's produced by Epic Times. I don't know what's which going on. Hello? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. You can hear me say yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. I don't know where that came from. I was trying to see. Okay. Anyway, um, sorry for that. I don't know where that glitch came, where that had it happen. But anyway, um, God be good. God is good. Now, this time we're looking at the issue of the, we're in the hour of God's judgment, and we have an issue of a one world government developing. The Bible foretells how what spirit is behind this unity of religion and this unity of politics. Let's go to Revelation 16, 13, and 14 for just a moment as we get as we lay the foundation now, as we talk about the ten horns and the uh one world government. Let's go into that. I was going to give you an I wanted to give you an urgency that your urgency right now, though you may see signs of the times and events that are happening all around us. 
your mind need to be on Jesus and the work of his work in the heavenly sanctuary of the most holy place at this time. Your mind need to be fixed on the word of God and fixed on working out your salvation with fear and trembling. While we're watching these events, brothers and sisters, the Bible said we are to do what? Watch and pray. Watch for the events, but not only watch the events down here, but watch Jesus in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary by faith. That's where our minds need to be at this time. All right? So it's very important that we understand this and keep that before us. All right? So at this point, I want you to go with me now. I want you to look here with me now in uh, Revelation 16, 13. Let's see the spirit behind it. Is it the Holy Spirit that's bringing about world religion and a one world government? Let's just see, according to the Bible, what spirit is bringing it together. I need to remember this, and we talked about this before in different, different other ways, but I want you to see it again very plainly. Let's go with me to Revelation 16, 13, and 14, and uh, let's read that together. Because somebody read that for us. Revelation 16, 13, and 14. Revelation 16, 13, and 14. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Notice very carefully, the Bible said that there will be a spirit or spirits, plural, that would be uniting, leading to unite the world together religiously. And we know that the Bible said these are spirits of devils that's going to be doing what everybody? Working miracles, which go forth to the king's earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. The Bible foretold this was coming. Brothers and sisters, we can see this event developing even as we talk. But let's go a little bit closer now. The unclean spirits are going to come together. That's going to unite the what? Spirit, they're coming. The first of all, the spirits are the dragon, come out the mouth of the dragon, out the mouth of the beast, and out the mouth of the false prophet. Dragon deals with uh, pagan worship. Dragon will also deal with political power. Beast deals with papacy. False prophet deals with apostate Protestantism. And through apostate Protestantism, we have the union of church and state developing, while at the same time, the papacy is seeking to bring all the world together as one. But the Bible said the spirit behind it is not the Holy Spirit, but the spirits of devils, and they're going to, they're going to sustain their working by working miracles. And they're going to go to the kings of the earth, that's the political powers, and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. From and sisters, we're heading for Armageddon. Mm -hmm. We are heading for Armageddon. And Armageddon is not a battle among the nations. Armageddon is when the nations of the world, with all their world government, are turned on the people of God. Armageddon is connected with Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Satan's forces will take the field and ready to battle against those who will be preaching faithfully the first, second, and especially now the third angel's messages with the outpouring of the spirit and latter rain power. And then Satan himself will even come as Jesus to try to circumvent the outpouring of God's spirit upon his people and giving a loud cry. Brothers and sisters, we can see the events that are now about to transpire. Now go back with me in your Bibles for a moment, as we look for a moment, and I want you to remember that those ten horns that we talked about, ten horns were a kingdom. But go back with me to, let's go back to our PowerPoint to be sure I'm take keep you on track with this point now. I want you to see. All right. Now, I want you to notice something very carefully. In our last study, in one of our studies previous to this, we've been talking about this for quite a while, the study, we found out one thing. We found out that the Ten Horns represented revolutionary France at one time. France represented the power that 
wounded the papacy in 1798. But we found out that one of the things we were dealing with was a controversy. Was, was France the last power or is Turkey the last power? And we found out that in a closer study, and we'll see a closer study on this online from our personal studies that we're going to be showing you later on. So don't worry, I'm outlining it right now, but we will go into more detail and greater depth in just a little bit on this issue. But I'm just going to give you this for now. And that is that the power, the papacy was wounded by Napoleon during the French Revolution. But Napoleon was also connected with the 10 horns of Daniel because France is one of the 10 horns found in Daniel chapter 7. All right. Now, if you remember, we had the names to those countries. Uh, can we rem do we remember? Do everybody remember the names of those countries? There was a hurry alive, the Vandale. Do we have a picture of that? I think it's in our PowerPoint. We have the hurry alive, the Vandales, the Ostrogoths. I, I want to make sure we can see for a moment what those 10 horns were so we can understand these are the Western powers of Europe. I need to keep that. I need to keep that in mind. Can somebody go back and look? Do we can, do we have a picture of that in our PowerPoint slide? I think we do. When because the little horn is going up Route Three, but it's coming up, and I want to see uh, if we can if we have a picture of that of the of the ten divisions of the Roman Empire in the West. Do we have a picture of that or a slide? Or can we pull up something? Because it's very important that people see that as we get into this. As we're going to talk about Rome changing laws later. Okay. Guess not. All right. So we'll we'll see uh, if that can be done. But now, what I want you to oh, here we go. Um, that's the King of North, King of South. You gotta go a little bit further. Um, we have a we have one that says the hurry alive, the Vandales, and the Ostrogoths. Uh, it shows it shows all the different nations um that came up. And I just want everybody to see that. I had a, I had my list here. I, don't, I thought I had it with me here. So I can just read it off to you. I know most of it's got it's gonna say the hurry alive. It's got a picture like a map, but it has different nations' names on it. It's in one of our, it's in our PowerPoint. I think it's an Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? And he shall rise up and he come up in the western part of Europe. I think that's right on our slides there. If you want to, if you want to go down the slide thing, I can show it that, look at that way as well. But I want everybody, I want everybody to see that so they can understand, identify this issue right quickly. I mean, it's easy to say it in the mind, but if it's, but if you see a picture that's clear on it, it will be, it'll be telling by itself. And so in Daniel, in Daniel 2, we talked, and, and most of you know this from Daniel chapter 2. Um, does anybody remember the names of the um, 10 divisions of the pagan Rome, of, Rome, of pagan Rome, which is in the West? Anybody remember what those 10 divisions were? Not yet, but I'll mm -hmm. look for it. You're talking about the uh, okay. Ostrogoths and the... Uh... Franks. Uh huh. The Ostrogoths. There you go. Here we go. This is what I'm talking about. This I want you everybody to see. Look carefully now. Here we go. I want everybody to pay attention now. This is very important. The ten horns. Now remember, these ten horns are also a kingdom. Somebody read Daniel. Go me to Daniel chapter seven. Go me to Daniel chapter seven for a moment. I want you remind. I want to remind you that the ten horns were a kingdom before the papacy rose up the power. Listen carefully. I want you to keep this in mind. In Daniel chapter seven. Looking here at verse uh, verse 24, look very carefully. In fact, okay, okay, Daniel 7, 24, and, the and the, what everybody, and the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise. Now, the 10 horns, the 10 horns out of this kingdom, the Bible makes it very plain. The Bible makes it very plain, brothers and sisters, that the ten horns, the Bible makes it very plain that the ten horns of this kingdom that we're looking at, brothers and sisters, are dealing with the issue of the um the rise, this before the rise of the papacy, these ten horns are called a kingdom. But now these were the watch carefully now, that the ten horns that represented a kingdom, what kingdom were they representing? 
they were still part of the pagan Roman Empire. And this is in the western half of the empire. And I want you to notice that very carefully. So this is still part of what? Rome. And Rome was the what? The king of the what? North. And the western half of the empire is being invaded, but the whole Roman Empire is represented as the king of the north. I need you to keep that in mind. All right. Now, what we're going to find later is when you study uh, what happened to when you study Daniel Revelation, but even by Uriah Smith, for instance, he'll say that when 1798 came, Rome ended and ceased. And so therefore, that was basically the end of Rome for a while. And it didn't seem like Rome was going to really make a comeback. So he went on talking about the next power that was available, which was in the west eastern half of the empire, and that was dealing with Turkey. So I, we understand that transition very carefully. But I want you to understand something very carefully. The Bible foretells that this these ten horns are going to be who? The Anglo-Saxons, the Servi, the Visigoths, the Vandals. But I want you to notice the Franks. The Franks represent the French. It was on the Clovis in 508 that the Franks put uh, put the papacy in power. And it will be later in 1798 that the Franks or the French would take the papacy out of power. So I want you to notice that very carefully. But the French are part of the what? Ten Horn Kingdom, which is Roman Kingdom, which is going to be under control for 1260 years when the little horn rises up for 1260 years. It's going to uproot three. It is coming. Look what it says. Three kingdoms were plucked up to make way for the rise of the papacy. The Western emperors of Western Europe were largely what? Catholic and supported and supported the papacy. Three Aryan kingdoms, however, did not. The and these, these Aryan kingdoms were what? The Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. And these were the three that were plucked up by the roots. But then when it came, when the papacy came to power, she ruled. Uh-huh. Watch carefully. Watch it. That's right. Let's rub back these. France is Rome's eldest son. You got that right. And so notice very carefully. So now this is the catch so far. France will wound the papacy by taking away her political power under Napoleon. When she takes away the papacy's political power, later Napoleon will also lose his emperorship in France. When Napoleon loses emperorship in France, who's controlling Europe? The papacy can't do it. So there's only one power that's going to control. The, the ten horns are going to be in control. But who yeah. is influencing the ten horns? The Jesuits. We're going to find, huh? The Jesuits. The Jesuits. Why? Because when they were suppressed in 1773, and from 1773 and three years later in 1776, they formed the Illuminati. Mm -hmm. And they formed, what? okay, under what? Adam Weishaupt. And from 1776, they sought for secular or control of all circular power and governments and money and banking. They linked up with the Rothschilds to get the financial backing they would need. And they would make a they, and they made a determination to take out all the kings and queens of Europe and punish them for having them suppressed. And they used Napoleon Bonaparte as their war horse to bring it about. And they're gonna also they also gonna attack the Vatican. For the Vatican on the Pope Clement the the fifteenth fourteenth suppressed the Jesuits and signed the letter said prayer they should be suppressed forever, and as a result, this is why the papacy receives a deadly wound in 1798, and then by 1815 the, at the Council of Vienna, the jet the uh, Vienna the uh, I think it's Vienna Vienna the Jesuits are reinstated. And now they're back on their mission to bring about world dominion to the Pope. And this is why you see later in 1929, you got Mussolini of Italy giving the Pope back his power and uh and 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 give him giving him back political power and recognition. Brothers and sisters, everything is here, but we'll we'll see it in a greater picture in a few more in uh in some of our next studies. Don't worry. But what I want you to see right now is that the Ten Horns represented the Western Europe, all right? All right, they were banned in many countries, that's right. But I want you to remember that the, the major ban that, that really hurt them the most is when they got banned by the papacy itself. 
And this is one reason why they want to use Napoleon to come back and take Pope, just as the Pope banded them. Now the Pope himself will be taken prisoner and exiled in Velas, France. He will experience what it means to be uh, exiled because that was what they did to the Jesuits and they confiscated their properties and everything else. But now, brothers and sisters, just because they did that to the Jesuits did not mean the Jesuits were in favor of Protestantism. Even though they sought asylum in Protestant countries, they still were able to, they still headed out to take out many of those Protestant countries because their loyalty was still to Rome. All right, so I need you to keep that in mind and to themselves as well on gaining power and position and authority and punishing those who they considered heretics or those who had uh, actually uh, the different kings and queens of Europe that had uh, asked for their suppression. So brothers and sisters, this is very serious what we're talking about and you'll see more about it as we go. Let's go. So now we see the 10 horns representing the Western powers, Western Europe, and we know now what they are. I want you, so you keep that in mind. All right, let's go back to what we were talking about a minute ago. So I can get the point. Now, as we look at this issue for what it really is now, we find that the Bible foretells that the papacy received a deadly wound. Now, during the time of her dark ages, when she ruled, it was under the Council of Laodicea that the papacy began to suppress the Sabbath. Remember, the councils were also part, the councils that the papacy had with many of the Protestants was also part of a counter-reformation. And so we need to keep that in mind, too. part of what? A counter Reformation. In other words, for everything the reformers had done, the papacy was seeking to counteract it or undermine it in a very subtle way, uh, while at the same time pretending like they wanted to negotiate with the Protestants and get them to sign a good different agreements, which they never held up to many times their own personal aspect of those agreements. And we'll see that in the, in the issues that come. But I want you to notice the Pope is of so great authority and power that he can do what, everybody? He can modify and interpret even what? Divine law. And so this is before, prior, prior to the papal wound that's going to come in 1798, the Pope and, the, and his emissaries have thought to change God's law. Was this prophesied in Bible prophecy? Somebody read for us Daniel 7.25. Daniel 7.25. I want you to see that with me for a moment. We go back and forth. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Okay, he shall think to do what? Change what? Times and laws. Now, this is what the papacy is going to do during the time she's still in power. She's going to think to change God's times and laws. Meanwhile, once you keep in mind, that as we approach this time, God is letting us see this history so we can take a look at some things a little bit closer. Now, I'm gonna, I want to remind you of something because we've been dealing with this issue of the, we're dealing with this issue of the uh, Sabbath, and we're dealing with this issue of this, we're dealing with this issue of the Ten Horns and New World Order. So let's put it in perspective. The papacy during the Dark Ages changed God's law. And we're going to see that right quick. And the reason why I'm saying that, because we come into the image of the beast, and you may not think that what I'm talking about is even connecting, but you will see as we continue to go, everything that I'm talking about is connecting. The Sabbath, the Lord's Day. On the first day of the week, when we gather together to break bread, Acts 20, verse 7. They gathered on the first day of the week to break bread, but it was not a day of worship. Recently, we received 80-page booklet entitled, What's Behind the New World Order? It admits to be a collection of excerpts from the book, Will America Survive?, which was originally published 100 years ago under the title, The Great Controversy. This book was written by Ellen G. White, foundress of the Seventh-day Adventists. It claims that the Catholic Church is behind the New World Order. The booklet claims that this is true since the church is the beast of Revelation 17. According to the booklet, one mark of the beast is not observing the Sabbath on Saturday. It is allegedly, listen, it alleged that in the fourth century, the church and the emperor Constantine replaced the Sabbath with the pagan day of the sun, Sunday. Now, brothers and sisters, now, wait a minute. What did we see in Congress last week when we're talking about this thing? Do we have a clip of that again where the guy says, I'm just concerned about 
everybody not going to church on Sunday because of a 32 hour work week. Do we still have that clip in our in our repertoire here? I want to remind you why we're talking about this issue in the light and how we're doing it. You're going to see that we're talking about the 10 horns and world government. But under the issue of world government, they're going to enforce Sunday observance and they're bringing in all simultaneously, brothers and sisters. Let's go to that, let's go to that next slide. Yeah, the Democratic senator. Let's see. That was a Demi that was a Democratic sen uh, that was a that was a Republican senator, I think it was. All right. I believe he I believe it was Democratic, Pastor. Democratic Center? Okay. Yes. It says, in the early part of the fourth century, Emperor Constantine issued a decree marking Sunday a public festival throughout the Roman Empire. All right. You can see Appendix Note 1. The Day of the Sun was received by his pagan subjects and was honored by Christians. It was the emperor's policy to unite the conflicting interests of heathens and Christianity. It was the emperor's policy to what, everybody? To unite what? The conflicting interests of the what? Heathens and Christianity. He was urged to do this by the bishops of the church, who, inspired by ambition and thirst for power, perceived that if the same day was observed by both Christians and heathens, it would promote the nominal acceptance of Christianity by the pagans and thus advance the power and glory of the church. Is that what we see taking place today? Is this history being repeated right before your very eyes? Yes. And I want you to yes, notice sir. very carefully. I want you to notice that the emperor in this picture is holding up a golden eagle, which was a symbol of sun worship and Mithra worship. It was a symbol of an early symbol, a symbol of Baal worship, but it's the sun, is a symbol of the sun. So Sunday for the pagans and Sunday for the Christians became the main thing. And remember, the Bible said that in the papacy, when she would come to power, she would think to do what? Change times and laws. So everything is happening. She would bring in pagan and heathen customs to replace God's seventh-day Sabbath. She would bring in the pagan Sunday to replace God's seventh-day Sabbath. Let's go a bit closer. But while the Christians were gradually led to regard Sunday as possessing a degree of sacredness, they still held the true Sabbath as the holy of the Lord and observed it in obedience to the what? Fourth commandment. So though the early Christians knew that they brought in Sunday, for the most part, they were still keeping the fourth commandment, which was the seventh day Sabbath. But let's go to our next slide and you'll see a little more as we continue. It says, and claiming authority over it. All right. It is true that the Catholic Church, through the authority of Christ, replaced, listen, it is true that the Catholic Church, through the authority of Christ, replaced the Hebrews' Sabbath, Saturday, with the Lord's Day, Sunday. However, this occurred very early, well before the time the Emperor of Constantine in the fourth century. For Christians, two important events happened on Sunday. First, this is what they say now. First, this is from the Catholic News Network. The CNA is Catholic News Network. They said this was an important event for Christians. It says at first, the resurrection of Christ occurred on Easter Sunday. Secondly, the Holy Spirit descended upon the church on Pentecost Sunday. All right. And after this, the resurrection, after this resurrection, Jesus appeared to his apostles twice, each on Sunday. As a result, Sunday became known as the Lord's Day for Christians. Now, brothers and sisters, did that justify? Now, you listen to this. Does that justify uh, Jesus? Uh, did Jesus actually uh, change the Sabbath to Sunday by his resurrection, by him appearing to the disciples on uh, on Sunday? No. Now, I need you to tell. Okay, you say no. Why do you say no? Because Mr. King, why you say no? Uh huh. Because they have the back. they have no. Go ahead. They use they use these two they use these scriptures out of context. They okay. can't they can't substantiate it with with. They can't these. substantiate it. Okay. All right. All right. Now, okay, there's one one comment says that use out of context and it can't be substantiated. All right. Anybody else? What, did anybody else get a reason for this? Do we have a Bible text to counteract any of these uh, statements? 
because they're saying this. Now, I want you to listen carefully how the Catholic Church did this. This is the Catholic News Network. Uh, listen carefully. This is what they said in their newsletter. They said for Christians, the two important things. First, the resurrection. It says here, first, the resurrection of Christ occurred on Easter Sunday. So what they're magnifying is Easter Sunday, because Jesus rose on Easter Sunday, then that means we should keep the Sabbath. Now, Baptiste, you just said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath, which is good, but we need to go a little bit closer. The question is, did Jesus inaugurate the resurrection when he resurrected? Did he say, okay, now I want you to start keeping no. Sunday because I resurrected? No. Did Jesus say that anywhere in the scripture? No. The, the, no. No. All right. But now what does the scripture say happened? Look here. Let's go back now. Let's go to let's we need a Bible text to back this up because we can't just sit there. You you right. got the let's, right let's, answer. Let's go, you got to correct it. You got to see it. All right, let's go to Matthew 28, Matthew, verse 1. All right, Matthew 28, verse 1. Let's go there. Matthew 28, verse 1. Now you're getting the idea. You got you got it, you got to say no, but you got to counteract it with the word of God. It says here in the end of the Sabbath day, correct. In the end of the what, everybody? Seven. Prior to Jesus' resurrection, yes or no? The yes, Sabbath the was Sabbath. not nailed to the cross or done away no. with at that point. Listen carefully. At the end of the Sabbath, it began to draw towards the what? First day of the week. And came Mary and Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, and her and her and the other Mary to the what? To the sepulchre. Now they came when at the end of the Sabbath, showing that Jesus' disciples, along with his mother, were all Sabbath keepers. Amen. They, Amen. They were not keeping the first day of the week. All right. So therefore, the Sabbath was still intact, and there's no scripture anywhere after Jesus resurrected that he commanded them to keep Sunday as the first day of the week because of his resurrection. Okay? All right? All right, so I want you to keep that in mind. So let's go, all right? And then when we go to Acts chapter 2, verse 1, what does Acts, Acts 2, 1 say? Let's go to Acts 2, 1. Because you got to see where they're 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 smooth. They're trying to be smooth with their operation, but they're still it's still error. Look carefully. Acts chapter two, verse one. The Bible says, "And when the day of Pentecost was fully come." Now they say that the Pentecost came on Sunday, but now did the day of Pentecost do away with the seventh day Sabbath? That's the question. Come on now, talk to me. Did the day of Pentecost do away with the seventh day Sabbath? Nope. No. No. The, an the answer is no. Do you have evidence that the seventh day Sabbath was still being kept in the book of Acts after Pentecost? Listen carefully. Do we have evidence that the seventh day Sabbath was still being kept after Pentecost? Yes, we do mm -hmm. have evidence of that. Come on now, y'all got to speak to the mic. I can't I barely, I barely hear you. Come on. Okay, we do have evidence of that. Um, there's a text in Acts that where Paul was 13. preaching when Paul Acts, was preaching. Acts thirteen, Acts thirteen forty four. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Thirteen fourteen, thirteen twenty seven, thirteen forty two and forty four. Okay, my brother. Okay, all right, my brother. You were saying something else. You said we do. We have what said again. The brother that was talking just before Brother King to, gave us those answers. Yeah, I was saying that um, there is another text in um, Acts uh, seventeen two. It says, "Then uh, I have to read it from the King James." I'm sorry. Let me get there. Okay, go ahead. Acts seventeen two. In the other text that the the other gentleman gave is also good. Mm -hmm. Acts seventeen two. It says. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them in three Sabbath days, reason with them out of the scriptures. And the other one was Acts um, 13, 13, and 14. And then Acts mm -hmm. 16, 13, Acts 18, 4. Okay. All right. Well, let's go back. Let's take a look. 
Let's look at your Acts 17, too, for a moment. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto, this, unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them. Now, three Sabbath days is three weeks, brothers and sisters. Three weeks, yeah. Uh, three different, three Sabbath day Sabbaths, which is, one, which is a weekly Sabbath. So therefore, for three weeks, Paul, on the Sabbath day, reasoned with them from the scriptures. All right? So the Sabbath here was being kept. Now, he also said Acts 13. Let's go to Acts 13. 13. That was 13. What? 13, 13. Which one? Acts 13, 13. All right, let's go here. Now, when Paul was in his company loose, loosed from uh, Papaios, Papayo, they came to Figria and Pompeia, Pompeia, remember, Pamp Pamphylia, it says here, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Acts 13, 13. And then 14, it says, in verse 14. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when they departed from uh, Pergria, they came to Antioch and Persida and went, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and, and sat down. Now, this is very interesting because here Paul is... Uh, uh, track, Paul is demonstrating that the Sabbath is still being what? Kept. You after read verse Jesus' resurrection. After, mm -hmm. after, after, after Easter Sunday. Y'all read verse 13. 15. All right. What were they 15. doing? All right, 15. Yeah. Verse 15. It says, yeah. after the reading, it says, and after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto, him, unto them, saying, ye men, of, ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of the exhort exhortation for the people, say on. And Paul stood up, all right? And the men of Israel gave word. That's verse 15, right? They were reading the law and the prophets. In the sense, it says, it says here, and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue, all right, sent, to, sent unto them, all right? But now I want you to notice again that we, we got evidence that the Sabbath was being kept after Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus. So there, for them to declare, for the Catholic Church to declare that because Jesus rose on those days, that's why Sunday should be kept holy. It has no scriptural foundation whatsoever. All right. Say that again. All right. All right. So we have, all right, let's go to, let's go to our next one. Let's go to the next slide. Next PowerPoint. So I want you to see with me. Just a moment. Now remember, so let me ask you a question. On a big picture now, because of this type of uh, very twisted idea of scripture, the people are now believing that Sunday is a day of rest. Just recently, Donald Trump came out with a Bible that he's calling it, I forgot what they call it. They call it Make America Pray Again. They, they, the, the theme now is Make America Pray Again. Mm. But also, uh, that's going to be the theme now, Make America Pray Again. This is a union of church and state developing, brothers and sisters, which is the image of the beast being formed before probation closed, as we're told. And now he's come out with a Bible that has a Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Articles of, Independence, Articles of Confederation in it. And uh, he's saying that this Bible is something that we need to keep because we've been losing our liberties. In this country. All right. All right. Trump and the Pope are playing Constantine. Rome is re re Rome is playing Constantine and seeking to unite the nations and the pagan religions together. They're going to take away the daily. You're watching the same thing happen that did it, they did back in the old days. And the rising mm -hmm. when the rise when 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 paganism gave way to the papacy. And so today the same thing is happening. Paganism pagan religions, along with apostate Christianity, is giving way to the papacy. We're watching the very thing take place. America is now giving way by saying that there's no such thing as separation of church and state, which is actually forming the image of Rome because Rome is a union of church and state. Papal Rome was formed foundation is church and state and the church having the power of the state. America's foundation was separation of church and state and the church, the, pe the people have the power over the uh the people had the power, not the church, not the state. 
brothers and sisters, this is what we're watching. And we're going to see this, we're watching this stuff play out in real time. This is why I'm telling you. Now, while this is going on, remember now, we're dealing with the Bible said those 10 horns. Now, we found out earlier, as we were talking, I'm giving it, we're going back and forth. We're sowing, little, we're sowing to let you see the small picture, yet the big picture. The big picture is that Sunday is about to be legislated soon as a day of rest. The small picture is that the small picture and then dealing with the 10 horns for a moment, the 10 horns we found represented the 10 kings of Western Europe. We found that Rome fell by, by Napoleon. And when Napoleon took down Rome, he was he had been influenced and he was being controlled by the Illuminati or the Jesuit order who controlled the Illuminati and also controlled Freemasonry because Napoleon was a Freemason. All right, let's go a bit closer. Now, if you put this, put put everything in proper perspective for just a moment. So France wounded the papacy in 1798. By 1804, Napoleon was crowned Emperor of France. All right, he was crowned Emperor of France. But France belonged to the ten horns of the kings and queens of Europe. All right, they were represented as the Roman kingdom but now they had been ruled by the papacy for 1260 years. So now they were represented as Christian nations. Keep that in mind. So, but now the, who was, who was influencing those nations? Who was influencing them? Uh, the Holy Alliance, which was controlled by the Masonic order and behind the Masonic order were the Jesuits. So no matter, even though Napoleon would lose that crown, of being emperor, and by 1856, he will be exiled to the island of St. Helena, which we're gonna see more about, like I said, in more, in more detail later. We're gonna see at this point that the power in Europe belonged with the 10 kings, the 10 horns, if you please, all right? So now this is, but the 10 horns are part of the Northern territory that was once ruled for 1260 years by the papacy, which is still Roman. Keep that in mind, brothers and sisters. Now, how? Now, watch this. So now the papacy is taken out. Now, in 1929, I mean, 1815, the Jesuits are restored and no longer under suppression. Their goal is again to, to do what? To reunite. Rome to give the Pope to just give back the Pope world power, which they've been seeking since that time. And in 1929, that first part came to came to fruition when the, when Mussolini began to recognize the Vatican again, give her back her power to be a state, a political power. Now, since that time, now Mussolini is from Italy, and he's part of the what? the Holy Alliance, and the Ten Horns. Everybody paying attention. I want you to see this. Now, by before 1929, what? Before 1929, we had another major event take place. The papacy received her fall in 1798. In 18, on August 11, 1840, you had the fall of the Ottoman Empire. When the Ottoman Empire fell on August 11, 1840, who did she fall to? Who did she fall to, brothers and sisters? The Ottoman Empire, they fell to uh, uh, the European nations. I want, you to, I, want, I, want everybody, I want everybody to see. I want to know what she fell to. Because if we make, I don't want nobody to say we're making something up or stretching anything. I want to know who she fell to. Okay. European because nations. Uh, European nations. What type of nations? European. What'd you say? What'd you say? European nations. Well, what are European nations talking about? Who are these European nations? Ten toes. Yeah, ten toes. But I mean, tell me. I mean, I got. What? You got it. You got to identify. Them. Were Were they not Protestant nations? Yes. They were. They 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 called themselves pro that was Protestant and Catholic. Mm -hmm. oh. Remember that Protestant and Catholic. But the Catholic Church at this point, because she ruled for twelve hundred sixty years, 
she was considered a Christian church. Y'all remember that now? Yes. So she wasn't nothing but baptized paganism in reality. Mm -hmm. But she was considered herself a Christian nate, a part of a Christian church. Now, I, I just, I'm just asking. I'm just asking you to look at that with me, so you can see the so you can see the event just like just like we're seeing it. All right. I want to I want to make sure we got we got that point uh, laid out. It, um, that's found in the Great Controversy. Um, it says here in the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before Josiah Lynch. One of the leading ministers preaching the second advent published an exposition of Revelation 9 predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. According to his calculations, this power was to be overthrown, quote, in A.D. 1840, sometime in the month of August, end quote. And only a few days previous to its accomplishment, he wrote, quote, allowing the first period 150 years to have been exactly fulfilled before Dekakosens ascended the throne by permission of the Turks and that the 391 years, 15 days commenced at the close of the first period, it will end on the 11th of August, 1840, when the Ottoman Empire in Constantinople may be expected to be, to be broken. And this, I believe, will be found to be the case, end quote. Your silence in the times of the signs of the times of exposition expositor of the prophecy August 1st, mm -hmm. 1840. At this, at the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the Allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. So I'm um, uh -huh. it should have right. been fallen to Turkey. So I think that's the answer. Yeah, but now notice who did Turkey surrender to? It says it says um, under the Allied protections of Europe, and thus place yourself okay, under ally, control okay. Christian okay, nation. Here, here we go. Under under Allied protection of Europe, Allied protection means they were in alliance with Europe, and they became under protection of what Christian nation. Mm -hmm. Now, for some reason, we have missed this because the answer has been staring us in the face from two angles. One has been staring us in the face because we've been in a big controversy in this church over is it Turkey or is it the papacy or is it Islam? Y'all remember, remember this. I'm not making anything up. And how is it that we missed this point? Is only God opening our eyes so we can see things in a more clear light. Turkey surrendered in August of 1840 to allied powers of Europe. The question is, who were the allied powers of Europe that she surrendered to? The spirit of prophecy just said Christian nations. Isn't that what you just read there in, in your great controversy? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, it says Christian nations. All right, now we need to do one thing. We need to identify the Christian nations. The Christian okay. nations were among the ten horns of Europe that were professed to be Protestant, or even Catholic, who had been ruled under the papacy because the papacy was not in power in, 18, in 1840. But the Jesuits, through the secret societies, were still influencing the events that were taking place because they had been reinstated in 1815. So, but Turkey surrenders to allied powers. Allied powers, that means they had an alliance with them and that and that the, the major aspects of Turkey had that alliance, and she led to the Allied powers of Europe. All right, these Allied powers of Europe were the Holy Alliance. All right, so they, but they were called Christian nations or the European powers. But that's still connected with the what? Ten horns, and, and those ten horns are Roman, not Islamic, and not Turkish. Because Turkey, it's in. If if Turkey surrendered to Allied powers, then that does that make does Turkey have independent power, or is she dependent on another power now? She's dependent on another power now. Dependent on them. Gave up her independence. So she she gave up her independence. So she's in tribute to this other power. Isn't that right? Yeah. Correct. Yes. So who has the power? 
Who ha who really has the power? The Ten Horns or Turkey? Ten Horns. The Ten allies, Horns. The Ten Horns, which are the Allied powers, they have the power over who? Over Turkey. Over Turkey. Yeah. So if the Allied powers have the have the power over Turkey, and even if they let Turkey stay in stay where she is, she's she lost her independence. Listen to this. This is right from Uriah Smith's own book, Daniel Revelation, page 516. World in prophecy. Listen carefully. The correspondence states, it says here, the letter of the correspondence of London Morning Chronicle, dated August 12, 1840, it says here, the correspondence states that the question of the subline port was... Uh, was put into the representatives of four great powers, representatives of four great powers, and the answer received yesterday. So in his own capital yesterday, the subline port applied to the ambassadors of four Christian powers of Europe. What? Four what? Four Christian powers of who? Europe. It says here, as to what measures had been taken in reference to the uh, circumstance vitally affecting his empire and was told that the provisions had been made, but, it, he, but he could not know what it was and that he needed to give not, he needed to not give himself any alarm about many of the contingencies, the contingencies which might arise. From that day, Yesterday, which was August 11th, 1840, they, the four Christian powers of Europe, not he, would manage that. And this is right here in the book of Daniel Revelation by Smith. They surrendered to four Christian powers. Somehow we've ignored this as though that was not important. And then we said the last power was Turkey. The last power in Daniel 11 is the Roman power because the four Christian nations are under the 10 horns of Daniel 7 and also is connected to, and France, all the rest are connected to those 10, those 10 horns. It's the Northern Kingdom still. It's the Roman Kingdom still. And so the last power in Daniel when Turkey falls, the last power is still Rome, with the influence of this of the of the of the secret societies to go with that and the Jesuit order behind the scenes. But brothers and sisters, it's clear. On August 11th, the period of 300, 391 years and fifteen days allotted to the continuance of the Ottoman power ended. Where was the Sultan's independence? Where was the Sultan's independence gone? You know, when we talk about major stuff, the devil will get busy, boy. I, I, you know, all kind of signal going, acting, acting crazy, everything else. Brothers and sisters, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we talk about these vital points that is important for all of us to understand and for us to understand that, all, that we are heading into the final scenes of Earth's history and that Adventists should not be divided on these issues, but that you have truth. And when truth is clear, it's clear to all of us. We're not taking anything out of context. We're not twisting anything. We're letting it, we let the history tell it for us. And Lord, we thank you for the prophecy that helps us correct it in understanding the issue of the 10 horns, the Christian powers, the Christian nations that were in France. Father, please open our eyes and please help us understand in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, brothers, I'm gonna go into, amen. We're gonna go into much more detail, but. I'm just taking you right now, step by step. You go back and look at it. You can go back and read the whole thing on the on your from your Ryan Smith's book on Daniel Revelation. But in the end, when you get down to the last pages, you read where Turkey surrendered to the Christian nations. So how did we miss the idea 
that the Christian nations were now controlling Turkey. And if Turkey surrendered, then the last power in Daniel 11 is not Turkey. The last power in Daniel 11 is the Christian nations because they control Turkey. And the Christian nations are the ten horns, which are ten kings. And the same ten horns, ten kings are going to help bring about the one world government. And then put the papacy back on the seat of world power. Brothers and sisters, do you see this? I'm, I just want you to see it with me. I don't, I'm not trying to make anything up. I want you to see it with me. That it's very clear what didn't happen. Let me let me ask you a question. Can y'all hear me still? Yes. Yes, we can okay. hear you. That's faster. Yes. Oh, yeah, my screen just keeps jumping here. Okay. Let me ask you a question, though. If there, if a power has lost its independence, can it go and come as it please? Can it do as it please? No. No. Not at all. No. All right. So, therefore, are they in control? No. 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 Can we recognize them as a world power that's independent and in control? No. 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 So how will we have to recognize those them or the ones that's controlling them? The ones controlling them. Controlling, the controlling them. I just want you to see all this time we've been stuck in a quagmire over who the last power is in Daniel 11 and the Bible is and the history that we got in the book has told us even though Uriah Smith himself believed that's what it was in his day, we find that he missed the idea that when Turkey lost her independence, she lost her power to have autonomy to do what it please. Therefore, she's no longer controlled. She surrendered to allied powers, but the allied powers, we didn't ever identify. He never identified them. Therefore, we didn't identify them. But the prophecy identified them as the Ten Horns. And even on the Eastern question, he, he had, they identified the aspect of the ten horns, but they didn't identify and, and they identified who they who they were, but didn't realize that because Turkey didn't surrender, that's the end of it. And that the prophecy is now going to repeat in Daniel 11, 40, when the Bible says the deadly wound, Revelation 13, 3 says the deadly wound is going to be healed. Daniel eleven forty said the king of the south, the king of the north shall come against him and came against the king of the south with horses and chariots and her wind, many ships, and shall overflow and pass over. This now is taking us into the final scenes of earth's history with the rise of the papacy coming back to power. Yeah, everybody understand what's happening here. August 7, 1840, and took you back to the first and second angels' messages being preached. 1798 took you to the deadly wound and knowledge increasing. And from 1798 to 1840 is 40-some years, which is telling you, giving you the history of the stretch that's taking us up to the first, second angel's message being preached, the fall of the Ottoman Empire, and at the same time, the conclusion that Daniel 11 is almost met fulfillment because now the next power to come on the scene, if we follow the prophecy correctly, was that Rome would be reinstated and would begin to fulfill the next verses that Miller and Smith thought were literal, so they interpret the last few verses very literal, but not realizing that when the papacy received a deadly wound and she make a comeback, that the last verses are interpreting Rome. And her coming back to power, leading up to the time when Michael shall stand up. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says, Look at Revelation 17. Look at Revelation chapter 17. We're going to see it again. Like I said, we're going to have some more, I'm going to have some more slides for you and everything else as we talk about this history going all the way back. But I need you to understand it. I'm giving you, I'm trying to give you point by point, step by step, a little bit here and there so you can get it. Look what the Bible says here. Go back with me for just a moment. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 17. Now remember, the ten horns was a kingdom, isn't that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do I, yes. Am I, am, I, am I making that up or is it in your Bible? It's in the Bible. In the Holy in your Scripture. Bible in Daniel 7. Okay, and write yeah. the Holy Scripture. All right. Now, watch this now. 
The kingdom at that time of Daniel 7, they were part of the kingdom of Rome. And when the papacy came to power and uprooted three of those horns and ruled over everybody for 1260 years, that was still under Rome and Rome was represented by the Northern Kingdom. And France was still part of the Northern Kingdom, though she was part of the Ten Horns. Isn't that right? I got anybody paying attention? Yes. I, I, I need to. Did y'all think with me now? But listen, brother, this, is, this has been a controversy, man, and God's trying to get us out of the quagmire because of where we are in Earth's history. Mm. You know how many years we've been going back and forth over this thing? And the answer's been staring right there in the scripture and in the history itself? Amen. And you ask yourself a question, did, I, did some of our professors see it? Or did infiltrators see it and made sure we never would talk about it and keep us divided? Mm, the latter, yeah. Because it was going to point. I'm wondering because I'm wondering I'm wondering about some of our professors and then and some of the people we have in our seminaries because brothers and sisters they should have saw this. Just looking back at the history and understanding what who, what's what, and the fact it said Christian nations. How clear can that be? There was only. Who were the Christian nations in Europe? Where did they originate from? It's, these are things that we should be able to answer. So I want you to see with it. Take a look, take a good look. Now, look at it, look at this issue with me. Dead Revelation 17. Now, 17 is taking in not only the nations of Europe, but 17 is going to take in the whole the whole political system that will be taking place. 10 is also a, a complete whole number, a complete number. So not only does it take in the nations of Europe, but it takes in all the world that's going to be under this power. Look what it says here. It says, in the 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received powers, kings, what? One hour with the beast. Everybody see that? These have what? One mind. So is it any wonder that you saw the World Economic Forum? Is it any wonder that we saw the World Economic Forum say that, are you ready for a one, a new world order? Is it any wonder, brothers and sisters, that you've heard stuff like that? Because they're part of the Ten Horns. And these have one mind and shall do what? What did the Bible say they're going to do? And shall give their, and give their, power, and strength to who? The beast. The papacy. The beast. Now you go back to the word. Now you go back to the word. word, word now you go back to the little book, words to the little flock. And who does, who, does, who does James White and them say the last power to be working just before Jesus come? Rome. Rome. Now we see it. Clear as day. Mm. See, it's clear as day, brothers and sisters. Can we understand now who Turkey fell to? We understand now that the prophecy concerning Turkey in August 11, 1840. And in fact, if we study Daniel Revelation, the last power, the last power that appeared in Daniel 11, uh, from Smith's standpoint, he looked at it as Turkey. But actually, Turkey had surrendered to the Roman powers that was represented by the Ten Horns, who had also been influenced by the Jesuit order. And later, will form a holy alliance to seek to bring back the Rome, back to paper Rome, back to power. Brothers and sisters, it's done. And I'm not saying it to be funny, but you can see, you can, you can, you can give any objection you want. You cannot, you cannot get around that the Turkish power surrendered to the European nations. And that's Western Europe, brothers and sisters first. And in Eastern Europe, but both were controlled by Rome at one point, papal Rome and the Jesuit order. We are heading now to the seams of the one world government. And the Ten Horns are about to acknowledge the papacy very soon with the union of church and state, with Donald Trump and all this going on at the same time. Rome is about to reach her zenith of power again. And our people are not paying attention. 
Pastor Bill, Brothers, I got one quick question. Do yes, you what's think that? that Donald Trump? Do you think that Donald Trump can be the president that can bring about the last the last events because everything is right? Now, one thing that is interesting about what's been going on the last several years, they harassed that man his whole presidency. That never happened in the history of the presidency. We know that he's a bad judge of character, and he did do some things to benefit us, but it's like, if he really was impeached twice and he broke the laws, he shouldn't be able to get back in office. And it's like, everything that's going on and what he did for the for the Christian church is like the... Uh, the national, uh, what you call it? The, uh, the I forget the name of it. the national. Uh, I forget Christian what nationalism. you call them, but it's like, yeah, Christian, Christian nationalism. nationalism. It's like, it's like now they pushing that if he get back in office, that will be the time to go on and utilize the power that he was talking about in his first election. So, do you think that this can be it if he get back in office? I mean, not setting a date or a time. Or do you think let, that this let, stuff can rapidly let, uh, increase? Let, let, okay, let me just say this. Donald Trump is, a first of all, a politician. Donald Trump professed to be a Christian. I cannot, I have no, no, com I have no comment concerning him, per him, his personal ideology. But I can say to the law and to the testimony, that they speak, not according to this word, there's no light in them. Donald Trump has a form of godliness and had denied the power. That's a fact. Profession is advantage for him because he did his he did his homework and he understands that the Christians are a formidable voting power to be reckoned with. And he proved it in the last election. Now, as far as that concern, that's as far as I'm going with that. We are told we are not to vote for these men. And I know I know, I know, you're not advocating that, but I just want to make it very plain. It doesn't matter who gets in office. All roads are going to Rome. The Democratic Party is going to Rome. With, even with Sunday observance issues, with a 32-hour 32, 32 work week. And the Republican Party are going to Rome with the union of church and state and declaring that the, there's no such thing as a separation of church and state. Mercy. All roads, all mm -hmm. roads are going to mm. brothers and sisters. Get ready. I'm warning you. Get ready. Put your put your put your put your house in order. Seek the Lord while He may be found, and let your election be seen with your name written in the book of life, and with your sins put away, and victory over sin through Christ's righteousness. That's the election that we all need to be concerned with. That's why I talked about the judgment for a moment before Amen. I got this issue about the arrest so that we can get, so we can put the perspective on what's important right now. This election thing, everybody's going to be caught up in that. The situation with the boat hitting the, knocking down the bridge, all that's, all that's, all that's creating chaos and fear. But brothers and sisters, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And to keep our minds focused on the work of Christ in that most holy place, a heavenly sanctuary. And that's where our lives and that's where our minds ought to be. Everything else is diverse. Some of these stuff is nothing but a distraction and diversion and, and fear and fear mongering, which will be happening because men's hearts will what? Fail them for what? Fear. The Bible says fear will be all over the place. Mm -hmm. But we cannot succumb to that. We must have our minds in fearing God. And giving glory to him by taking on his character and witnessing to the world with the character of Christ. Because that's the only thing that's going to stand. And that's why I told you earlier, our knowledge of the Bible, our knowledge of the word of God, our understanding of these things that we're talking about right now is critical at this point. Because we don't need to be divided as a people over these issues any longer, especially in Daniel Revelation, especially in present truth circles. We need to be on one accord and we need to preach one message and we ought to have one mind and stand as one man against this stuff that's going on in our world. It's time for God's people to proclaim the three angels' messages, especially the third, along with the first and second, and preach that thing like no, like your life depend on it. 
and the lives of others around you and to warn them of the judgments of God that are coming as a violation of his law. The, the judgments of God are coming. Fire, flood, earthquake. All these things are going to be happening even more frequently. Climate change is going to be more frequent. But they're going to bring on the judgments of God as they violate his holy law and make void his commandments. David said in Psalms 119, 126, it is time for you to work, O Lord, for they have made void thy law. God's trying to get us ready. Amen. We're going to see, we're going to see more in our next study. Brothers and sisters, I'm trying to get you to see it because some of this stuff is kind of, some of it's kind of new to us. To even hear the some of the stuff we just talked about. Brothers and sisters, it's clear from the history and it's clear from the Bible what we're looking at. Bible first, then the history. And we got the spirit of prophecy quotations in their right fall in their right places when we break this thing down correctly. And so it's clear the last power is not Turkey, but Turkey was the last of the uh, last the last to fall on the Roman Empire on the eastern on the eastern part of Rome. We know that the history is there, but the Roman power is still going to be the last power because the ten horns are part of the Northern Kingdom which was the previous kingdom of the papacy. So it's still, they, they, Northern, those 10 horns represent your, was representing your king of the north. And they're going to give their power and strength back to Rome. They're going to bring the whole world involved and give it back to Rome as the world is ready now to push for the mark of the beast. And we're going to talk more about that on the morrow. We're going to get into the issue about the Sabbath and the mark and all those different things as well. But I want you to just see with me, brothers and sisters, where we are. I know it takes a little time. I'm just going over it a little carefully with you and helping you see a bigger picture and small picture all at the same time because brothers and sisters we don't have a lot of time and we don't know how long we're going to be on the air either the days are coming when we won't be on none of those of us who preach this present truth message are going to be on brothers and sisters please take good notes go back and search the scriptures daily and check it out, see if it's so. At this time, we have our song of appeal, and we'll come back and pray. I regret the hours I have wasted And the pleasures I have tasted That you were never in And I confess that though your love is in me It doesn't always win me when competing with my sin And I repent Making no excuses I repent No one else to blame And I to fall in love with Jesus I bow down on my knees And I repent I the idols I've accepted, the commandments I've rejected, to pursue my selfish end. And I confess I need you to revive me, put selfishness behind me. And take up my cross again And I repent Making no excuses I repent No one else to blame And I to fall in love with Jesus. 
I bow down on my knees and I return to fall in love with Jesus. I bow down on my knees. Brothers and sisters, may God help us all be ready. Because what we're watching now is the events that are now leading us into world government. That's going to now lead us and escalate into Sunday observance and a time of trouble. The final movements are rapid moves. And God's people are not ready. And the Bible says that no man think he stand lest he fall. I pray that God will help me be ready. And I pray to help you be ready. Brothers and sisters, fortify your mind with the word of God. Prepare your heart. For Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Prepare your heart now. Let us pray. Father in heaven, it's solemn to think, Lord, that your word has revealed to us what shall be. And to see the events be taking place before us in real time. Oh, Father, thank you. And we pause to give you praise, honor, and glory for the spirit of the living God who has revealed these things to us and has made our minds acquainted with the scriptures and the history. Oh, Father, help us prepare to meet our God. Help us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling and seek to keep our names written among the living in the book of life. And let us not yield to the image, the mark, or the number of his name. Please, Lord, we are weak as water and we need the divine strength. We need to take hold of divine power. Please help us not yield, but help us yield our members and yield our mind to the will of God. And like David, let us be able to say, I delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, thy law was in my heart. The law of love, which is the foundation of your government and throne. May your law of love be in our hearts. And may we love you more than life itself. In Jesus' name, amen. Up my cross again, and I repent, making no excuses. I To blame and I return to fall in love with Jesus. I bow down on my knees and I return to fall in love with Jesus. I repent.
The future of your business is here. With Wix, you get advanced AI. Not in running, but in resting.